Planned Parenthood decides that of all days of the year, all 365 days of the year, that the day they should use specifically to raise money for abortion is Mother's Day. You know, they're going to kill the babies that make people mothers. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about transgender culture and how that plays into today's Mother's Day culture. We're also going to discuss the relationship between humans and nature and pets specifically and what the Bible has to say about human beings and their relationship to pets and nature. Then, of course, Ted Cruz gets a haircut. This is Deconstructing the Culture. I am your host, Elisa Steele. This Mother's Day looked a little bit different for me. Not because I'm pregnant, actually. Um, I didn't celebrate Mother's Day this Mother's Day, which I, I don't know. I, I just honestly didn't even think about it um, until I had a whole bunch of followers wishing me Happy Mother's Day, which was really sweet. And so if you were one of those people, thank you very much. You guys are very kind. Um, but that aside, I actually got into a lot of hot water this Mother's Day. Now, if you haven't been watching, um, then I'll just, I'll catch you up on it later. But if you have been watching, then you know what I'm talking about. But for those of you who are longtime listeners of the podcast, or even just longtime followers on Instagram, you're going to know that I do have a pet peeve. And my pet peeve is actually about pets. So I'm going to catch you up on that just a little bit, very briefly, later in the podcast. But first, we're going to talk about Planned Parenthood. Now, just when we thought they couldn't get any more despicable, actually, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't say that this is more despicable than what they actually do and perform as an organization and what they promote, but I do have to say it's incredibly tone deaf. I mean, Planned Parenthood literally decided they were going to do a Mother's Day campaign to raise funds to kill babies. It, it's just beyond, it, it honestly does kind of blow my mind, and I do wonder, and I, I feel like I should ask my friend Abby Johnson this at some point, now, when you're working for Planned Parenthood or you're working in an abortion clinic, do you see how it could potentially, maybe, possibly be against your messaging to celebrate Mother's Day when you're literally killing the babies of the mothers that would, anyways, it just, it kind of, it kind of makes my mind wonder if they're just willingly, willfully evil, um, the directors and also not just the directors, but the campaign, the social media managers of Planned Parenthood. Um, but we know that Planned Parenthood doesn't actually promote parenthood. They don't promote motherhood. But the abortion train, this abortion chain, Planned Parenthood, they destroy more unba unborn babies' lives every year than any other group in the United States. Um, in an article from LifeSite News, I love LifeSite News, so definitely give them a ch just check them out if you haven't already become familiar with them. They, pa Planned Parenthood, has been accused of discriminating against its pregnant employees and refusing ultrasounds to mothers who want to keep their unborn babies. They, you know, mothers come in and they're like, hey, we don't want an abortion, we want an ultrasound. They've been accused of actually just being like, no, we're not going to give you an ultrasound. Um, Planned Parenthood was also caught falsely advertising prenatal care, um, which most of its sales facilities do not provide. That's a huge lie that they like to push forward, that they care about women's health and they offer prenatal services. But I dare you to call your local Planned Parenthood or any Planned Parenthood and ask them for prenatal services. And they don't, they're, that's basically non-existent at their facilities. But Planned Parenthood this year had the audacity to celebrate Mother's Day on Sunday through social media and email. It had this flowery fundraising email, including a poem honoring mothers, quote, this one's for the mothers raising families and moving mountains. When hugs and kisses can't be shared, meaningful words go a long way. Forward this email to a mom or maternal figure in your life and consider making a donation to Planned Parenthood in their honor. Wow. Okay. So if you sent this to your mom on, let's just, let's just imagine you're on Planned Parenthood's mailing list and you get this email, do you forward it to your mom and say, Hey mom, thanks for not aborting me. By the way, I'm going to donate in your honor. Yeah. That kind of sounds like a, I don't know, maybe a horror flick, really gross, gross, menacing theme to send out on a Planned Parent e email. If you ask me, um, it's Twitter post contained a similar sentiment saying, quote, from moms at home to moms on the front line, thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Understandably, 
and it did not go over very well. The abortion group's Twitter post quickly was ratioed. Now, if you don't know what ratioed is on Twitter, it's when you get way, way more negative comments than you actually get likes. And so on Monday, the post had over 6,000 comments and barely 2,000 likes, which is pretty big in the uh, Twitter world. So Town Hall highlighted a couple, couple of pro-life and conservative leaders' responses to the abortion clinic, um, saying, uh, here's one of them, quote, praying for all the mothers you've made childless, likely feeling deeply sorrowed today. Daily Wider Amanda Pris, I don't actually know how to say her last name, um, Amanda Prescottio wrote, this is a joke, right? Daily Caller Virginia Connett added, Americans United for Life, whose leader knows personally the pain and regret of abortion personally, says that the post made her cringe. And um, the founder of Culture of Life for Africa responded to the tweet with disgust, writing, Planned Parenthood, an organization that prevents and steals motherhood from hundreds of thousands of women each year is wishing us a happy Mother's Day. It's exactly right. Honestly, the truth is, is Planned Parenthood's idea of helping mothers um, and wishing them happy Mother's Day is to kill their unborn children who would make them mothers to begin with. And abortion, it, it, just in case I haven't made myself perfectly clear, abortion doesn't unmake you a mother or it doesn't prevent you from becoming a mother. You are a mother from the time of conception. It just makes you the mother to a dead child. As truly tragic as that sounds, that is what happens when Planned Parenthood is, is promoting this on Mother's Day. They're saying, here's to the mothers who killed their children. Here's to the mothers who decided to allow us to to murder their children and um yeah you should donate money so we can kill more mother's children it's truly despicable really just nasty now let's talk about motherhood and let's talk about the term mom i believe that we live in a world where our our language is being rewritten at a very intense and destructive pace now um, this doesn't even seem like at the forefront battle anymore, which I think is really, really sad. But for years, the battleground was over the definition of marriage. We talked about marriage for many, 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 many generations. And it was very clearly understood that marriage is between one man and one woman. And it is primarily and originally, originally it's, or originates from a biblical perspective or even just a religious perspective. Um, and we have adopted it into our secular world, but even in the secular world and having, you know, legal marriage, we understood that marriage meant between one man and one woman. Well, we've corrupted that word. Unfortunately, as a culture, we have allowed that word to be corrupted and twisted and turned so that now marriage has been redefined for all intents and purposes in our, within our culture. Now, we are fighting that battle within our churches and within our home fronts, and that is the place for us to be definitely teaching that and fighting that battle at, the, at its fiercest right now. But we've primarily, honestly, largely lost the battle, the language battle when it comes to the word marriage. We've allowed it to become corrupted in our legal system as well as, honestly, even just in our media and secular world, in our movies and our TV uh, just our, our entertainment consumption has severely gone a long way in changing the public perception of the word marriage. Now, unfortunately, we've kind of moved past that battle. I wish that we as conservatives and even just as Christians would cling to that cause more and creating a culture that does understand marriage in its, in its true form, which is one man and one woman. But there's other ways and other battlefronts that we're still actively fighting when it comes to the language battle, another one of these language battles is who is a mom and who is a dad and what, and what defines mom and what defines dad and what defines male and what defines female and also what defines gender and what defines sex. Because for a long time, gender and sex were interchangeable. We always knew gender and sex were the same thing. Now we have a leftist battlefront and a cultural battlefront that tries to tell us that gender and sex are two different things. Don't you know your sex is your is your biological makeup and your 
your sexual organs. Your sex would be your vagina or your penis. Um, but gender, don't you know, gender is different. There's a spectrum, spectrum for gender. And you can be anywhere on the, on the spectrum of gender. And you could be, your sex could be female. You could have a vagina, but your gender is male or non-binary or gender fluid. I mean, now we're being told that there's an endless amount of genders and gender and sex are different. And again, it comes down to this language battle. The language battle is very important. It does, whether we like it or not, shape our culture in a very big way. And unfortunately, it is leaking into our world on every level, not just in entertainment and media, but in our legal system, in our school systems, children are being taught this corruptness from the corrupt uh, understanding of the word marriage now to the corrupt understanding of gender and sex and male and female and being whatever you identify as that's what's that's the the main words we know this and this is a recap you and I know this if you're a long time or even just first time listener of this podcast if you're a long time conservative you understand that this is a word war that does matter definitions matter words matter roles matter. Clarity is important. Now, trans moms, apparently that's a thing now. Um, I, I say that sarcastically, of course, but uh, we have now what we, what our world is calling trans mothers. Trans moms are biological men who are fathers in many cases, um, but identify as female, so now they're moms. Now, I found this obscure little blog. I think it's she, it was she knows.com. And they had an article on parenting and um, why trans moms hate Mother's Day. And here's why. So this person starts out the article saying, today we honor moms everywhere for the hard work they do. We shower them in love and presents. And it's all well and good for but for many trans moms, Mother's Day carries a heavier meaning. This is their chance to be both privately and publicly acknowledged as women and as mothers in a world that didn't always see, that, see them that way and still may not. This author, even just in her words right there, is, is affirming what I am telling you, that words matter, that titles matter. Even in the transgender world and our leftist counterparts, they agree that words matter and yes, many in the transgender community and in the leftist community today do take the day, they take Mother's Day and Father's Day, but we're focusing on Mother's Day right now, they do take that day to blur those lines and say, don't you know, biological men, they can be mothers too. And that's when we have to draw a line in the sand and say, no, this is what a mother is. And a mother, obviously, you know, if I'm not perfectly clear already, I've, I've stated this for years on Instagram, a mother can be an a birth mother, a mother who, you know, gave her baby to adopt up for adoption. It can be a working mother, a stay-at-home mother, an adoptive mother, a foster mother. Um, I know many, I'm not so much familiar with this, but I know a lot of people take godmother um, in that role very seriously. Um, there can be mother-like figures, surrogate mothers. Their mother does have a, a definition, and it also does have various roles that that can, that can play out in, but we all agree that it's a female, and we agree that it's a female mothering and filling a role to human children. Now, you're going to see why I, I define those specific two things, which I think are important, but right now we're focusing on it needs to be a female. I don't believe fathers. I don't believe that men can be mothers. Dads cannot be mothers. End of story. So this author continues, continues in their article. After all, how would you feel if your kids refused to call you mom? Jody, who came out as trans to her 11-year-old son when he was just five, says she still doesn't get, the author's calling it a she, obviously we know it's a he, she still doesn't get a Mother's Day card from him or any acknowledgement on that day. In fact, I don't get Mother's Day. I'm not allowed. His school won't accept my ex his my existence of or that of same-sex couples, Jody says. I even got asked not to pick him up from school. Jody's son has even come home with Father's Day gifts a few times over the years, she says. It's hard to know whether her invisibility as a mother is due to his transphobic school, the influence of her child's other mother, who continues to disregard Jody's transition, or because her son herself, excuse me, 
because her son himself doesn't view Jody as his mom. He still calls me dad, Jody says, even though he refers to me as his mom. I don't know why. You don't know why? Because you're not his mom. You are not his mother. You are a man. Men cannot be mothers. I'm sorry. You could play a fatherly role or you could just be his father. And that is a beautiful role too. But you, this person clearly needs help. Medical help and psychological help and emotional help and probably spiritual help on every level. This article continues, Mother's Day, understandably, remains a source of deep anxiety for Jody, who finds herself dreading the day as it looms ever closer. I hate Mother's Day. I get so depressed about it, she says. Every other day of the year, our relationship is fantastic, but this day rolls around and I just start to get really stressed out. It makes me feel like some kind of dirty secret, something to be ashamed of. Well, obviously, I wouldn't go so far as to say that your relationship is fantastic if your son is still calling you dad and knows your dad and you are a dad and a father and a man, and yet you are forcing your delusion and your sickness upon your 11-year-old child. That is wrong. I'm sorry. Your kid shouldn't be in your custody at all. It is child abuse to push sexual perversion on children, including if it's your own sexual perversion. It's gross. It's wrong. Honestly, there should be, I think, legal protection against children being exposed to that. Now, later in this article, the author ends with, many schools and daycare centers are now choosing to do away with Mother's Day and Father's Day activities altogether to avoid being alienated or left out. Some schools are now celebrating a non-gendered day such as Love is Love Day or Special Friends Day to make it inclusive for all types of families. Again, this is me coming back to language matter, teaching our children matters, making the lines black and white matters. Now, um, they continue, this author continues, uh, la, 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 la. not because we want to deny the importance of mom and dads, this is the schools, but because we want to celebrate and foster relationships that are welcoming, inclusive, and culturally competent uh, about different family makeups. Uh, just sickening, but after, she, she continues and ends with, after all, considering how Mother's Day or Father's Day feels for the child who is in foster care, the child who has two moms or two dads, the child who has been raised by grandparents, the child who is a solo parent, or the child who is a parent who is incarcerated or otherwise currently estranged. No child wants to feel different from all their peers. Inclusivity is an essential part of any education system, and steps to move beyond traditional Mother's Day and Father's Day expressions and celebrations are a positive step forward for all families. And for this reason, perhaps doing away with Mother's and Father's Day altogether is the best idea after all. Yeah, just gross. Now, first of all, we shouldn't get rid of Mother's Day and Father's Day. I think it's important to, to celebrate the fact that there are so many wonderful mothers and fathers and that mothers and fathers who do it right, whether that's a foster mother, adopted mother, birth mother, whatever, they do deserve to be celebrated and, and lifted up for their sacrifice. It is an incredibly sacrificial and honorable title and role to play in a child's life. But the truth is, is I, it's the first part of this um, ending that I read, this person points out that, you know, what about the, per the kid who's in foster care? Yeah, what if they have really wonderful foster care parents? They can celebrate them. Or this person, uh, they point out, are people who are raised by grandparents or a child who is a solo parent or the child who has a parent who's incarcerated or otherwise estranged. I get it. And I get it. And, and children will get it too, unfortunately. Now, the way to protect children from these situations is not to get rid of Mother's Day and Father's Day altogether. That's not the case. Yes, children should be protected from this. And unfortunately, children do have to be in these situations where they're in foster care or they have an estranged parent or they're raised by grandparents or raised by a single parent. Unfortunately, that is the world we live in. But the fix is not to fix this situation by getting rid of Mother's Day or Father's Day. It's to make it so that children are not in this situation. Now, you know, if you know my story at all, I was raised by a single mother from essentially more or less age zero to eight years old when my mother remarried. Now, her first time around being married, I was born into a plug in this family. So that's why I say essentially a single parent from age zero to eight. Because even when I did have my father in my life until I was about three or four years old, I am not discounting, I, without getting into it too much, I'm just going to say there's only so much time, attention, and love you can give to your children when you have 30 plus children and five plus wives, okay? I'm just going to 
<laughs> just that's the reality of the situation. Polygamy is not the healthiest place to be, and I would not recommend it to anyone. I don't think polygamy is healthy. It's not a good place for the children to be in. That Putting that aside, then I spent the rest of my young growing up years until I was eight years old raised by a single mom, okay? And yeah, Father's Day was a thing, I guess, but we didn't really celebrate it. I didn't notice it one way or another. And yeah, sure, maybe it was mentioned at school, but like I said, yes, it's unfortunate that children are put in a situation where maybe they can't fully celebrate Mother's Day or Father's Day. The solution is not to get rid of the day. The solution is to try to eliminate the broken family system. It's tried to create a whole family system where mom and dad are in a stable, married, healthy relationship. Okay, that's the solution. Now, before I continue on, I just want to ask you to please take a moment to subscribe and leave a review. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit subscribe and then hit the little notification bell because nowadays um, to really even see the videos that you subscribe to on YouTube, you have to hit the notification bell. So for sure, hit the notification bell. And then if you're listening on YouTube, or excuse me, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, uh, Stitcher, I, you know, I, um, excuse me, yeah, iTunes, wherever you're listening to it, just go ahead and subscribe and leave a five-star review. The reviews definitely mean a lot and they help with the ranking of the podcast, so don't forget to do that. Now, I'm going to go ahead and continue on to the second part, and this is the part I told you. I got a little bit of hot water this Mother's Day. I have a pet peeve, and the pet peeve is people using the phrase dog or the, the term dog mom or cat mom or cat grandparent, cat, whatever it is. I use dog mom because it's the most common one that I see. But the thing is, is we do have a culture today that tells us that men can be mothers and also the pet owners can be mothers, which is really bizarre to me because I feel like that is ridiculously obvious to just about anyone that owning an animal doesn't make you a parent. Um, I'm not going to spend too long talking about this because I talked about it extensively on Instagram and you're welcome to go read those feelings there. But the, the long and the short of it is I believe that Again, language matters, definitions matters, roles matter, and sacred titles such as mother do matter. Being a mother is a very, very sacrificial and huge role that's unlike any other role in this universe. And um, just wishing to be a mother, it doesn't make you one. And I'm told somehow by today's culture that owning an animal can somehow make you worthy to use the term mom. And I'm like, no, sorry, you're not a mom. You're a pet owner good for you. Furry friends are lovely and great, but the truth is, is you don't teach your pets your values, your traditions. You don't teach your pets your faith. You don't raise up the next generation of freedom fighters and faith defenders. That's what you do with your children. Pets, they come and go. Children are forever. Um, pets are not going to give you grandkids or leave a legacy. They're just animals, okay? And and I think that's something we need to remember in today's culture is they're just animals. I know you're really attached to your animal and that's great and they play a role in your life and that's lovely, but they are still just animals. And like I said, I've been super attached to my own pets in the past. I get it. I raised a baby goat that was uh, rejected from its mother on day one. And so I got to bottle feed that goat and raise that goat. And I was very, very attached to that goat. I've been attached to dogs, to cats, to chickens, to bunnies. I've had a lot of pets and I really, really loved them. And that relationship with pets can be more than just fun. Um, and one of the things that I was getting the most backlash on and most hateful comments, both on private messages on Facebook and on Instagram, is these kind of vitriolic individuals being like, how dare you be so hateful and angry and mean because so many women can't have children. So how dare you tell them they can't be moms to their pets? And I'm like, you can mother your pet. That's different. That's an action. We can mother lots of, we can mother creatures. We can mother our nieces and nephews. I mean, but it's still different, even just the nieces and nephews. Animals are animals. And it is incredibly tragic when women who yearn to be mothers are somehow unable to be mothers, whether that's biologically or by adopting or by foster parenting, whatever the case is, it is sad and it is tragic and it is world changing. And I'm not diminishing that by any means, but you are diluting the word when you use mom up in, a, in a, applied to people who own pets. You're a mom if you have miscarriage your child. You're a mom, mom if you are a foster parent. You're a mom if you've lost your child at any point. Motherhood is sacred. Motherhood is beautiful. 
and you know it, it's just it's such a, a special and sacred and and honoring role and honoring name we don't just apply that to pet owners i'm not saying pets don't have their place they absolutely have their place as comforters they can be an incredible solace to people who need that companion who are alone or empty nesters or can't have children i mean they're wonderful as guide dogs as therapy dogs they have their capacity and they are as the term goes man's best friend because pets have a very dogs specifically have a very special role in our life, but it is not the role of children. It is not the role of child. And I'm going to be honest with you. We live in a society that is hardcore pushing the idea that animals hold the same value as humans. That's why we have these, you know, intense vegetarian vegans saying, you know, we need to treat all, all animals exactly the same we would as humans. And I'm sorry, but we're not the same. And we never will be the same, especially from a biblical perspective, which I'll get into in just a minute. Now, there is a disgusting push in our world to bring pets up to the same level or higher than children in value. Our culture is elevating the status of animals while devaluing human beings. Now, human beings have devalued to a status of just being a choice a choice that can be aborted on a whim if a child's not acceptable or desirable to them because human beings are disposable, apparently. And according, according to some extreme global rights activists, yes, there should be less humans and we should kill off more humans. And we should abort as many humans as we can because don't you know humans are evil, 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 bad, and we should kill them all. And there should be less of them. But, there, but at the same time, nature and pets are being raised up on a pedestal. And that's wrong. That's gross. And that is the culture I'm combating. I'm not saying you can't joke about being a dog mom, okay? I get make, making jokes about fur babies or making jokes. Jokes are different. There are many, though, who do take that intensely personal if you tell them you're not a dog mom. Um, I can't tell you how many people I saw posting on social media, like, oh, and even just throughout the year, like, oh, I'm celebrating Mother's Day as a dog mom. I got flowers and coffee and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, stop. For one day a year, hop off the delusion bus. You're not a mother. Pay respect and honor to actual real mothers who make the sacrifices of motherhood in whatever capacity that looks like. And no, you're not a mother and you don't deserve that title. So that's mostly my point in, in saying that. I think that it stings to hear the truth for some people, but the truth is, is the title of mom is reserved for actual moms, not pet owners and, or whoever wishes to identify as a mom. That includes men who wish to identify as a mother. Even if it stings a little, I really think we all just need to laugh at ourselves, laugh at our pet jokes. That's fine. Hop off the delusion bus. And remember that when it comes to our furry friends, they can be adorable companions and very close to our hearts. Um, and they can even feel like part of our family. But mom and the word mother, mother and mom is reserved for those who truly are mothers. I think it's, it comes down to a language thing again. Now, um, Here's the thing. I also want to make it super clear that there's a deeper issue. It's not just people using the term dog mom or cat mom or however you want to take that that I am talking about when I talk about this issue. I also think that there's a deeper, like I alluded to earlier, there's a deeper underlying issue in our culture where we're promoting nature again to be higher than humans higher than mankind now i was recently reading actually in dennis prager's book um i was doing some comparison notes when i was reading my bible the other day and he, in his book genesis god creation and destruction now um i was reading and he was actually talking about under under genesis 8 yeah Hold on. Genesis chapter eight, um, verse one, there's a verse that says, God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle who were with him, with him on the ark. And God caused a wind to blow across the earth and the waters subsided. Then Dennis goes on to explain how God made nature for man. And I'm going to skip over part of that. And I want to go to, um, he, he starts out by, or he, he, um, has a section that starts out by saying one such example of the elevation of nature into a godlike status is um, 
is uh, da, 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 da. I'm actually going to skip that part and skip to the part where I really want to read to you is um, essentially if there is no, excuse me, if there's no God higher than nature, and if man is not more, more important than nature, then nothing is higher than nature. Let me explain. There are a series of moral prices paid for elevating nature. Chief among them is that human beings cease to have special value positioned by the Bible. Okay? The Bible is theocentric. That means God-centered. And anthro, yeah, anthrocentric, man-centered. And if you collapse the God-centered view of the Bible, you also collapse any supporting reason for the world to be man-centered either. And so... As counterintuitive as it may seem, human worth is dependent on there being a God, specifically the God of the Bible. The belief human beings that, be, excuse me, the belief in our world that human beings, especially within Christian communities and religious communities, that Christians, or excuse me, that human beings are more important than any other creature, more important than nature, more important than animal, actually comes from the Bible, specifically that Man is created in God's image, okay? That's the easiest way to put it. And if there is no God, then whose image are we created in? That The answer is no one's. Man is nothing more than dust. And if there is no God, humans are no more than one part of the ecological system and a destructive part at that, which is how much of the left views humankind. That's why they think we should be wiped from the earth. Now, if you continue on later, he says... Um, there's a great difference between being created in God's image and being a collection of particles. As nature is elevated, human worth is reduced, and humans are reduced to the status of animals. What ine inevitably follows is the equation of, of humans with animals. Humans are increasingly described as other animals in the commonly used expression humans and other animals. Now, here's another portion I want to point out when it comes to man and nature is. Either man will rule over nature or nature will rule over man. So if you look in Genesis, I'm going to refer to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1.28. The rule of fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and all living things that creep on the earth. So basically God blessed them and God, and God said to them, be fruitful and increase and fill the earth and master it and rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and all the living things that creep on earth. So God grants man dominion over the animals and of all of nature because man is a higher being. He alone is created in God's image. And though obviously a physical being is like God outside of nature, nature is not sacred, human life is. God intended for man to dominate the world, the natural world. That's when in, in the phrase, they shall rule. This does not mean humans have the right to abuse nature or to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals, but it does mean the world was created for human use. The man is depicted as a ruler over the animal kingdom and the whole earth means he is to rule over nature, which is in stark contrast to the pagan worldview according to which nature ruled over man and man worshiped nature. That is definitely the historical pagan worldview. All the pagans could do in the face of nature's great power was offer sacrifices and perform incantations. Then it goes, Prager goes on to talk about how um, the biblical instruction to rule over nature has profoundly and fluent societies touched by the Bible. He talks about how our Western world has been the one who has been able to conquer diseases and conquer nature that would wipe us out inevitably. Many secular people in our time romanticize nature, though, perhaps not realizing or wanting to realize that either humans rule over nature or nature will destroy humans. So either we will conquer natural diseases or they'll conquer us. Either we rule over, not abuse, the animal kingdom, or it rules over us. In fact, until the very modern age, people everywhere feared being eaten by wild animals. But for the most part, especially in the Western world, we don't fear that anymore because we have fully come into being the rulers over nature. Now that obviously means being a good steward. I had someone on Instagram say, but Elisa, like, uh, even though, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're made in God's image, like animals are still God's creation. So shouldn't they be treated just the same? And I'm like, no, they're not just the same. We're made in God's image. We are completely on a different level 
than animals are. And yes, it means being a good steward. It, it, the Bible also talks about taking care of animals. There are many instances in the Old Testament specifically where the Bible will talk about treating your animals correctly. And it, the fact that in the Ten Commandments and when it specifies, um, I believe it's in the Ten Commandments. I know it's in the book of Exodus. It specifies taking care of your animals and giving your animals a day of rest. So obviously we're supposed to take care of our animals and treat our animals well. It does not mean abuse our animals. And um, that's a whole nother topic in the food industry. But animals are here to serve a purpose and the purpose is to serve human beings. All that to say, it comes down to what I'm corely talking about here and that humans or animals are on completely different levels. We are not of the same value in any shape, way, or form. All right. Really quickly, we're going to go ahead and actually skip over music because I took too long. But um, this week, I had my husband watch Sense and Sensibility because, you know, Pride and Prejudice BBC five-hour version was so successful. And his only commentary on Sense and Sensibility is that the plot line wasn't as good as Pride and Prejudice, but it was what much shorter and he felt like that was better. Also, he feels like Jane Austen is super predictable because like going through the movie, he immediately could tell who was going to be the villain, who was going to marry who, like five minutes in. And I was like, what the heck? Is it really this predictable? And he's just like, yeah, it's Sense and Sensibility is almost the exact same storyline, I feel like, as Pride and Prejudice. Now, I disagree with my husband, but that was his take. So in case y'all were wondering who suggested the next chick book I should have my husband watch. We watched Sense and Sensibility, and those were his thoughts on that. Now, um, Good in the World is one silly one and then one more serious one. Um, Ted Cruz got a haircut at Shelley Luther's Dallas Salon after her jail release. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar with that story, there was a lady named Shelley. She opened up her Dallas hair salon before the state decided to officially lift that and, and allow salon owners excuse me, salon owners to open. And basically the judge, the judge straight out told her like, you're being selfish by opening your salon, even though she was practicing social distancing and using a mask and whatever. But she said, no, I'm sorry. I'm not being selfish. I'm paraphrasing, of course. It's like, I'm not being selfish. What's selfish is that my stylist can't feed their kids. They're going hungry. They need to make money. I'm not being selfish by having my employees go back to work. So she was put in jail. She was only in there for a short time, um, but uh, there was a huge stink about it. Uh, there was a GoFundMe page and it actually reached over 500,000 before further donations were dis disabled. So she was sentenced um, for seven days behind bars. She only actually spent two of those days behind bars before she was released after the Texas Supreme Court intervened. But after she did get out, Ted Cruz decided to visit and he said, Quote, I'm proud to stand with Shelly Luther. What happened here was wrong. Mr. Cruz told reporters outside the salon, it was ridiculous to see somebody sentenced seven days in jail for cutting hair. That's not right. That's not justice. That's not Texas. I thought this story was awesome. I wanted to share a way for, I always, I, I, I primarily agree on most things with Ted Cruz. And overall, I just think he's a pretty great guy. I met him a couple times, but I thought that was awesome. The other good in the world is a beautiful story of, uh, a child, an unwanted child, suppose uh, air quotes, unwanted child was found in a trash can about a year ago, close to where I live in Boca Raton, Florida. And newborn was actually found alive. They were able to take care of her. She was adopted. And now she is a happy, healthy one-year-old who just celebrated her first birthday. Um, and she celebrated with her father and her four-year-old brother and close friends this last Friday afternoon. And the truth is, I just want to point out that calling a child unwanted doesn't make the child any less human. A child is still wanted. And I would argue that there are no, there is no such thing as an unwanted child because someone somewhere wants that child. So that is a beautiful world that we live in where we can find our humanity. We can rescue those children who are discarded so heartlessly and evilly by their parents and we're able to adopt them and love them in beautiful families. That is good in the world. And I just want to say, I think that is beautiful for this family to adopt them and love this little girl as their own. With that said, I want to miss, wish you a happy Mother's Day for 2020. You moms who are actual real moms, you rock this world. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Special shout out to my own mother who is absolutely beyond words incredible. She is my hero.
God bless you. God bless America. This is Deconstructing the Culture. I am your host, Elisa Steele. Hey there. Thanks for watching or listening to this podcast. Thanks so much for being part of the podcast family, Conservative Babes. Go ahead and remember to subscribe, leave a review, hit the notification button so you don't miss an episode. See you next week.